Guest tonight on Perspectives is an attorney with expertise in constitutional law and international issues. She's also an associate professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and the CUNY Graduate Center. She's worked on various law and policy issues concerning women, children, and people of color in the United States. She is a best-selling author and a very good friend of the show. Ms. Gloria Brown Marshall, we thank you for joining us here on uh, Perspectives once again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Good to have you back as we are talking a little bit about President Obama and that's going to be the focus of conversation for the next 30 minutes as we talk about President Obama uh, and basically just about a year uh, we can say that he's been in office and really want to get a chance to really shape up how the president has been faring. We know that he gave the State of the Union address uh, a couple of weeks ago and to many people it was a very important address uh, because I think when you look at all that was going on in, in America uh, it had to happen, and the president spoke to so many of the issues. The president spoke to many, many issues. As a matter of fact, it was overwhelming. The agenda that he has taken on is amazing, not just locally with our domestic issues, but also issues dealing with our trade with other countries. Also, of course, with the economy, health care, and um, issues of law, issues of policy. And many people criticize him because they feel he's taken on too much. Mm. Let's talk about the importance of the State of the Union address. It comes on the heels after uh, Massachusetts Senator Ted Kennedy's seat is lost to Scott Brown, a Democratic seat turning Republican now. And then the question begins to emerge now whether or not the president actually has enough to be able to pull it for a second term, given the fact that many of these seats that were considered, quote unquote, blue states and blue seats and losing gubernatorial seats, now all of a sudden they seem to be turning Republican the question goes into the State of the Union address. If the president doesn't hit it on the head, uh, he could be a one-term uh, a, a one president. But from your perspective, uh, did he hit it on the head? I think, as I said before, his agenda was very ambitious. I think that based on conservative, liberal types of dictates, the Republicans came into this his administration not supporting him mm. with a dictate that they were going to undermine everything that he did. No matter what, the fact that we have Republicans staying away from conversation, refusing to vote, even when there was an initiative that was started under the Bush administration, and now that the president is actually doing the very same thing, they're mm -hmm. no longer supporting it, their idea is to get the White House back and Congress by any means necessary. So if that means that we stall progress for this country while the president is in office for only one term, that is their agenda, based on what I can see. Let's talk about pushback uh, during the State of the Union address. One of the things that a lot of people were focusing on was the controversy that uh, the president had in regards to Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito. And uh, obviously, the, well, basically, we'll set this up like this. The president had criticized the recent Supreme Court decision permitting corporations to buy unlimited ads to influence elections. And uh, we'll take a look at what the president said, and then we'll take a look at Justice Alito's reaction. With all due deference to separation of powers, last week the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. To spend without limit in our elections. And once again, there you saw the Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito basically mumming the words. That's wrong. And uh, when you saw Justice Alito saying that's wrong, your response? Well, for one thing, if you go back, and I had my classes at John Jay College, actually go back and review the video, the Supreme Court justices are supposed to be without passion one way or the other. They're supposed to be completely objective. And that's why you see them just sitting there when all both sides of Congress are standing up cheering one way or the other or jeering if they have to. The Supreme Court is supposed to sit there without any expression whatsoever. For a U.S. Supreme Court justice to say not true to the U.S. president in front of the president, that's why they sit right in the front, is something that's unheard of. Mm -hmm. And um, what is happening now is even civil government, the idea of civil society is being breached. We had Wilson before yelling, you're a liar, you lie. You know, if you think about it, you know, the, what's happening with this president is something that's not happened in recent memory in the treatment of the president, even with George Bush, who actually did lie. Right. <laughs> when you didn't have anybody stand up and call the president a liar during a, a State of the Union address. What do you attribute this to? 
Some people have contributed it to race. Other people have contributed not directly to race, but the idea that this president, does, going back to your question, does not carry enough power to actually harm these people who are attempting to harm him politically. Mm -hmm. And if he does carry that kind of clout, he's not using it in that particular way. So when you look at the facts, so people do say race, and they do come up with the issue of race. Well, the president, you know, if, if, if uh, you know, President Obama was white, this, these kind of things would not be happening to him. Agree, disagree. I think I agree on the one hand, if President Obama were white and it did happen to him, he would stop it immediately. Immediately, he would have the clout to stop it. But at this point, we have a black president, and whatever he does, it's colored by, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't mind my saying that, by the act of a person of African descent. So if he were to put a strong arm down, it's a black man strong arming Congress. Mm -hmm. You know, so he tries to play it nice, as we've seen happen too many times in corporate America, in which people try to be extra nice in order to accommodate the opposing views of others when you're a minority group, whether or not you're or a person with um, physical challenges or woman, if you're the person who's outside the majority group in a position of power, you try to appease those people as best you can. Many black people are tired of him appeasing other people and wish he would put a firm hand down. Remember during the election when he stood up and said, enough. Mm -hmm. He said enough and you saw a whole crowd rise up and say it's about time. Tell mm -hmm. these people about themselves. Mm -hmm. So this issue of the campaign finance is a very important issue because Barack Obama won this election with five ten dollar fifty dollar donations given by millions of people. So that populist type of, of financing is now being countered by corporate financing. Mm -hmm. I want to get into the bipartisan approach in just a few seconds, but I want to get to this because at the State of the Union address, uh, much was focused on what the president was said, what the president said, I should say, and then there was another uh, uh, focus on what people were saying about the president. One person in particular, Chris Matthews, who says, "quote unquote," you know, I forgot that President Obama was black for about an hour. How? Because this, this idea of color blindness is so ridiculous to me. I don't want you to miss my color. I think my color is very attractive. I enjoy being an African-American woman. Why must I no longer have any pigment whatsoever in order to please somebody or allow them to actually hear me? Why must I give up gender? Why must I give up who I am in order for somebody to hear the words that might save your life? The president is working on a health care initiative. The question then becomes, are we unable to see what he's offering in this health care initiative because it's a black man offering it? Mm. When you think about the Tea Party, for example, and this is something else, this whole convention of the Tea Party and this radical conservative movement, and I have no problem with people making complaints about politicians. It's in our First Amendment to petition grievances against the government. We have the right to do that. Mm -hmm. But if the grievances are so ill-conceived because they have been blinded by race, then it makes you wonder what stand are these people really taking? And if they're going to appreciate the fact that if this president does get our country on the right road, will they give him the credit? I doubt it. I doubt it. I think that they have been satisfied with the fact that he's in office, and now the question becomes, will they allow him to govern? I want to take a quick break and come back and talk about the bipartisan approach that the president is talking about taking, dealing with the issues of the economy and health care. You're watching Perspectives here tonight. Darren Jaime will be right back.